Some ships are known for exciting lives. Others are known for their longevity, or for their notable wrecks if they sank. And, of course, there's the museum ships. Then there are the ships known for one thing, and one thing only. Today's Saturday Extra looks at one of those in the form of USS Hammond, an unfortunate destroyer with a short-service life, one that ended in a submarine torpedo while trying to save USS Yorktown. And that unfortunate sinking is what the ship is remembered for. However, that wasn't the entire extent of her service, even if the rest of it was fairly short. So in this video, we'll cover the rest of that story as well. In Hammond's case, that story began as the fourth Sims-class destroyer. The ship was laid down on January 17, 1938, and launched on February 4, 1939. A little over a year, which wasn't bad for peacetime. Certainly not the speed reached during the war, of course, but not bad. The fitting out went faster, with USS Hammond commissioned on August 11th of 1939, a little under a month before the Second World War began. Of course, that didn't mean much for the destroyer at first. The United States was officially neutral for the first two years of the war. As such, Hammond's initial service was fairly quiet. Not quite peacetime, but not active conflict either. Before that, however, we need to cover the design detail. As a Sims-class destroyer, Hammond displaced 1,600 tons at her standard displacement, with the full load going up to around 2,240 tons, although the original design called for something closer to 1,900 to 2,000 tons. Weight increases came from additional anti-aircraft weaponry, among other factors. And on the topic of weaponry, let's look at that now. This began with five 5-inch 38 caliber guns in single mounts, two super firing pairs with one pair on the bow and one on the stern, and a fifth mount just ahead of the stern pair. That mount would, however, be removed later. These were fairly overloaded ships, thus the removal. You see a similar thing with the torpedoes. Initially, the ship carried 12 21-inch torpedoes and three quadruple mounts, one on a raised platform on the center line, and two on the deck on either side of that. This was later reduced to eight torpedoes and two quad mounts on the center line. To round off the weaponry, Hammond carried a mix of anti-aircraft guns, initially a handful of 50 caliber machine guns, later replaced with 40 millimeter guns and 20 millimeter cannons. Although the exact number varied between ships and on the time frame, Hammond was, as we'll see, sunk fairly early, so she would have had a lower number than her surviving sisters. It was most likely four 40mm Bofors and two twin mounts, and four single 20mm cannon to support those. The final weaponry, as designed, consisted of two depth charge racks on the stern. Those will be important later on. For now, all of this equipment could reach a pretty good speed. 37 knots on 50,000 shaft horsepower through two shafts. And with that, we can round off the design and look at Hammond's service, which, as stated, began in quiet fashion, at least in terms of combat. It did, however, have a notable event right out the gate. On June 10th, 1939, the ship was nearby when USS Warrington brought King George VI on a royal tour of the United States. And then, four days later, Hammond was on her sea trials, where the destroyer would reach a top speed of 40 knots before coming to a total stop in 58 seconds. And then, to further test things out, she went 20 knots in reverse. Impressive, to say the least. After the ship formally commissioned on August 11th of 1939, her service could properly begin. For the next two years, Hammond operated on training and patrol duty, 
She would perform this task on both the west and east coast. Although the ship was in the Atlantic on December 7th, 1941. Specifically in Iceland as part of the forces stationed there. It wouldn't take long, however, for the destroyer to swap back to the Pacific. Hammond departed Iceland and returned to the east coast and from there to the Pacific. Hammond left Virginia on January 6th of 1942, where she would then transit Panama, arriving in San Francisco on January 22nd. From there, it was on to Pearl Harbor to properly join the war effort, which was, admittedly, also pretty quiet at first. Hammond would escort Task Force 17 from February 25th, 1942. This took the destroyer to the South Pacific, where she participated in training exercises around New Caledonia. Those took place in early March, before the task force was then assigned to the Coral Sea. This saw raids on Japanese forces in late March, where Hammond served as USS Lexington's plane guard, before the group returned to port on April 20th. This was only a temporary rest, however, as the Japanese began their moves on Tulagi and Port Moresby, which led, of course, to the Battle of the Coral Sea. Hammond was, once more, Lexington's plane guard during this action. Although she was detached on May 4, 1942, to pick up a couple pilots down near Guadalcanal, Hammond would arrive at the island near dusk, where she picked up the two pilots. Although the water was choppy, so this required pulling them aboard with lines rigged out from the whaleboat. When that was done, Hammond returned to Lexington, where she would remain four days later when the battle came to the American fleet on May 8, 1942. Hammond served well in this, firing at the Japanese aircraft. Unfortunately, she couldn't do enough to protect Lexington, not through any fault of the ship or crew. Things just happened that way, especially early war. Lexington would be hit hard and would ultimately sink after massive fires and internal explosions. Hammond helped pick up survivors, which ended up being nearly 500 men in the end. Fortunately, the destroyer had avoided damage of her own despite a dive bomber landing a hit just 200 yards from her bow. After the survivors were rescued and emergency repairs were concluded, the task force returned to Pearl Harbor. Hammond would go along, shifting from guarding the sunken Lexington to the damaged USS Yorktown, a role the destroyer would remain in for her second battle. Because after Yorktown was hastily repaired at Pearl Harbor, the carrier and destroyer sailed for Midway, where both ships would ultimately meet their end side by side. But first, the actual Battle of Midway. This came on June 4th, where Yorktown was the focus of Japanese attack. Hammond once again did her plane guard duty well as she sailed close to Yorktown and put up a hail of fire. Unfortunately, just like with Lexington, it wouldn't be enough. Yorktown was hit repeatedly, with the worst being two torpedoes. Those caused severe flooding, in addition to cutting power. Yorktown would be abandoned as the list reached 26 degrees. However, the carrier remained stubbornly afloat through the entire night. So a salvage crew was put together and sent aboard the crippled aircraft carrier. This stabilized the ship, enough that Hammond could come alongside on June 6th. The destroyer would provide hoses and water, along with power and other support for the salvage. Unfortunately, it also kept her a stationary target. A target in the sights of a Japanese submarine, I-168. This boat had snuck past the escort screen and lined up an attack run. Four torpedoes were sent towards Yorktown. One would miss entirely, but three hit. Two passed under Hammond slamming into Yorktown. The final torpedo hit the destroyer amidships. USS Hammond broke in two. The crew quickly abandoned ship as their destroyer sank beneath them. 
It took only four minutes for the last of the broken warship to vanish from sight. However, that wasn't the end of it. As Hammond sank, her depth charges went off. This explosion would be the final nail in Yorktown's coffin. It also killed men in the water from the force of the explosion. Between the initial blast and the depth charges, 80 men would be killed. The rest of Hammond's crew were picked up by the destroyers Benham and Balk. And the destroyer vanished from history after just two battles. I've seen comments on my Midway Wreck videos asking why the wreck hasn't been found. It's true that she's near Yorktown in relative terms. But Yorktown took some time to sink and drifted away a little bit. So close is still not right next to the carrier. And the depth charge detonation probably obliterated the stern section. I'd expect that all that's left of Hammond, in any recognizable sense, is the bow. And that's a very small target to find. Perhaps someday we'll see it. However, that day has yet to come. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe if you enjoy the content, and I'll see you in the next one.